If you've been following SpaceX for a while, you've likely noticed that the company consistently pioneers recovery techniques for its rockets. From landing on a drone ship to catching the tower, Elon's company set itself apart from the others in the aerospace industry. For decades now, the industry has faced a persistent reality. Rockets were either partially destroyed after launch or they never came back to Earth. This represents quite the waste, especially considering humanity's ambition to explore the vast universe beyond our planet. SpaceX, however, has completely transformed this narrative. The company developed bold methods for recovering and reusing rockets, shattering traditional limits, and redefining the approach to manufacturing and launching spacecraft. The Falcon rocket series in particular has been instrumental in this process. Since SpaceX's first successful landing of the Falcon 9 rocket in December of 2015, the company has recovered approximately 376 rocket boosters and reused them in 352 launches. This achievement has not only revolutionized spaceflight, but also demonstrated unparalleled economic efficiency. Now, some may argue that NASA has also recovered spacecrafts and solid rocket boosters, refurbing and reusing them for later launches. And while that's true, it's crucial to consider both the technical and economic efficiency in comparison. The entire shuttle program cost $192 billion as of 2010, averaging $1.4 billion per mission across 134 flights. By contrast, the commercial price for a Falcon Heavy launch, which boasts double the payload capacity, is only about $150 million, not billion, million. This stark contrast highlights that while the space shuttle was a historic achievement, cost optimization was not its strength, especially when compared to the groundbreaking advancements SpaceX has made. So, how can this issue with the space shuttle be explained? To be honest, the only part of the space shuttle that wasn't reusable was its large orange fuel tank. Most other components were recovered and refurbished for reuse. Each orbiter underwent extensive refurbishment between missions. Technicians conducted thorough inspections and replaced critical components as needed. One of the most challenging aspects was the thermal protection system. Each individual heat shield tile was meticulously examined and replaced if necessary, as these tiles were essential for protecting the spacecraft during re-entry to Earth's atmosphere. The solid rocket boosters, or SRBs, posed another economic challenge. While they were designed to be reusable, the recovery and refurbishment process paradoxically turned out to be more expensive than just making new ones. After each launch, the SRBs parachuted into the ocean where they were retrieved, cleaned, inspected, and prepped for reuse. This process required extensive disassembly, testing, reassembly, incurring substantial labor and material costs. The reality contradicted the original version of significantly cutting launch costs, making the space shuttle program quite expensive. In contrast, SpaceX approached the problem differently with the Falcon 9 rockets, introducing the concept of vertical takeoff and landing for reusables. From the space shuttle, SpaceX learned that merely building a reusable was not enough. A launch vehicle also needed to be quickly reusable and also cost-efficient. The latest iteration of the Falcon 9 has minimized the need for extensive refurbishments. The average turnaround time for a booster has been reduced from 356 days to just 107 days, with the fastest turnaround currently at 72 days. The record now stands at a very impressive 21 days. SpaceX does not necessarily aim for ultra-fast turnaround times with Falcon 9, as it maintains a big fleet of boosters ready for launches across the country. However, SpaceX's ultimate goal is to achieve a refurb time of just 24 hours. To do this, they aim to match the rapid turnaround process of commercial airliners, with each rocket needing only a quick inspection between flights. During the short refurbishment period, the first stage of Falcon 9 undergoes a series of maintenance and inspection procedures to ensure nothing gets overlooked. Once the booster's back on Earth, either by road or sea, it's transported to SpaceX's hangar. SpaceX currently has several refurbishment hangars where Falcon 9 operations take place between launches. The landing legs are typically folded before getting placed on a transport vehicle. However, in the past, SpaceX faced many issues with the landing legs, often requiring manual removal. The landing legs are perhaps one of the most frequently refurb components as they experience significant impact when they land. After the booster is brought back to the hangar, the refurbishment process begins with each engine undergoing rigorous checks to ensure all components are flight ready. According to Elon, each Merlin engine can do up to a thousand flights without needing refurbishment. However, another benefit is the ability to examine an engine that's completed multiple flights and identify the parts that wear out the fastest. 
this is certainly one of the reasons why Falcon 9 is the most stable rocket in the world. The hydraulic grid fin system also needs to be checked for any leaks. Fuel tanks and pressurized vessels undergo a series of ultrasonic tests to detect small cracks that could lead to failures after the rocket's pressurized for flight. This is perhaps one of the biggest unknowns for every Falcon 9 rocket. With each mission, SpaceX gathers vast amounts of data on the pressure cycles that each tank can withstand. Once the booster passes the inspection process, it undergoes a static fire test with all nine engines before getting attached to the second stage and payload. Right now, all these checks still need to be completed as they enter the realm of multiple reusability. Each mission provides them with additional knowledge about the number of flights each booster can perform, and over time, the refurb process gets even more refined. And in the future, we can't help but look forward to SpaceX achieving even more milestones with Falcon 9. But is that the only thing SpaceX has accomplished? Of course not. SpaceX's continuously evolving rocket technology has enabled the company to develop a new recovery method with extremely high turnaround efficiency, catching rockets using a tower. Unlike the Falcon 9 landing system, SpaceX plans to use the chopstick arms on its launch tower to catch the Starship rocket. This innovative approach was demoed during the Starship Flight 5 launch in October, showcasing SpaceX's groundbreaking advancements in rocket recovery. For a booster or Starship catch, the rocket approaches the tower, enters the gap between the splayed arms, hovers in place, and then the arms close around it. It eventually comes to rest on hard points that appear to offer about as much surface area as a coffee table. As built and shown, they are closer to a tiny fixed landing platform capable of minor last-second positional adjustments. Eventually, the chopsticks could shave off a small amount of time off of post-recovery processing, removing the need for a crane or the same arms to attach to a landed booster or ship. With Falcon 9, SpaceX deploys three to four landing legs during the rocket's landing onto the drone ship. But here's where the issue arises. Perhaps one of the areas SpaceX has learned the most from their Falcon 9 landings is the landing legs. For Falcon 9 landings, the booster needs to be transported back to the refurbishment hangar, where many parts are replaced and checked. One of those crucial parts is their refurbishment process in the landing legs. All this takes a lot of time and is not an option for Super Heavy. Removing the landing legs entirely from the design not only simplifies the turnaround time, but also saves an incredible amount of weight. Every kilo saved allows the rocket to carry a heavier payload to orbit. With six legs on the Super Heavy, the overall mass of the landing apparatus will be about 10% of the whole booster and landing. Quite honestly, the rocket catching capability is extremely unique, but also quite complex and challenging, leading many space enthusiasts to wonder why SpaceX doesn't just make rockets in a simpler way. Why don't they let Starship take off and land like an airplane? In reality, a spacecraft like an airplane has disadvantages compared to a rocket. You're traveling for longer through the air, which means you have to deal with drag more. On a rocket, you spend very little time in the atmosphere because you're heading straight up rather than going up at an angle like a space plane does. It's better to get out of the densest part of the atmosphere than turn over and travel sideways after that. If you've got a jet engine or an air-breathing rocket on your space plane to make up for the fuel losses of drag, it costs a lot more than developing a rocket engine. Rocket engines are cheaper to manufacture because they don't have to be designed to intake air at subsonic, transonic, supersonic, and hypersonic speeds. Other than the distinction between vacuum and non-vacuum rocket engines only have to be designed for one environment, so they're simpler than an air-breathing space plane engine. Re-entry is harder in a plane. Re-entry vehicles have to travel through hypersonic, supersonic, transonic, and subsonic speeds, as well as deal with re-entry heating. Space planes have to be designed to withstand all that. The Space Shuttle Orbiter's design had to make several compromises because of this. They used large, heavy, and vulnerable delta wings to deal with the varying wing speeds. It had to have thousands of heat-resistant tiles that needed replacing every few flights, and it had to have a giant heavy fin to control yaw while traveling through the atmosphere. Falcon 9 first day just slows down before re-entry, then free falls until the landing burns, avoiding pretty much all that. Planes' bodies are more complex than rockets. A plane is a complex shape designed to reduce drag and produce lift. A rocket is a glorified tube or propellant. You just roll a strong enough aluminum alloy into a tube and you got the rocket body, put in some propellant tanks and engines, and voila, you got a rocket. In short, each vehicle is designed for a specific environment. Planes are designed for flying, rockets are made to go to space. Try to make a perfect rocket fly through the air, and it will require so many compromises, it turns into a plane. 
try to make a plane for spaceflight, and it'll likely turn into an overly complex rocket. A while after the conclusion of Starship Flight 6, critical data related to landing both stages of Starship rocket has become clearer than ever. This data will be invaluable in helping SpaceX successfully carry out the upcoming Flight 7, for which NASA just revealed the launch date. So what is this new data? How might it change the trajectory of Flight 7? When did NASA announce the launch date of Starship's next flight? One might assume that the water landing of the Super Heavy booster would end with a fiery finale, but that wasn't the case this time. Recently, reports confirmed that Booster 13 remained afloat on the ocean surface rather than sinking to the seafloor as expected. Footage captured during the event shows Super Heavy gently floating upright on the water at night. This followed SpaceX's decision to forego attempting a tower catch during Flight 6 and instead allowing the booster to land in the ocean. The live stream from the company revealed the booster resting on the water with its nose pointing upwards. This remarkable buoyancy can be attributed to the pressurized inert gases stored in the rocket's propellant tanks after its fuel was depleted. These tanks are designed to maintain structural integrity during flight without pressurization, they'd collapse inward, potentially causing a catastrophic failure during launch. In this case, the tank's residual pressure contributed to the booster's ability to stay afloat after landing. Even more impressive is the fact that the booster stayed intact despite being engulfed in a cloud of fire upon landing. Unlike previous missions where boosters disintegrated upon water impact, this time the rocket maintained its structural integrity. The outcome is a testament to the engineering and precision landing capabilities of the Super Heavy booster, even without the aid of the tower's catching arms. Personally, I was shocked to see this. The external engine bells appear to have weathered the event remarkably well, highlighting the booster's robust design and SpaceX's continuous improvements in reusability. We cannot overlook the impressive progress in Starship's design that's improved with each successive prototype developed by SpaceX. Before, Starship Booster from Flight 4 marked a significant milestone as the first SpaceX booster to get recovered from the ocean. It executed a controlled splashdown, becoming the first booster to achieve a gentle water landing. Over the course of the Starship program, SpaceX has steadily enhanced its performance. For instance, the booster from Flight 3 attempted a water landing but suffered engine malfunctions that resulted in its destruction upon impact with the ocean surface. Images shared by Elon reveal that most of the outer ring of engines on Flight 4's Super Heavy booster stayed intact, although its inner ring and the core structures were absent. As for Booster 13, it remains uncertain whether SpaceX will recover it or deliberately sink it to the ocean floor once again. Why the deliberate sinking? Reports and footage suggest SpaceX may have intentionally scuttled Booster 13 shortly after the water landing. Observers noted what appears to be impact on the booster's aft section, potentially caused by 20mm or 50 caliber rounds fired from a ship visible on the left side of the frame during the live stream of Flight 6 by Everyday Astronaut. Kudos to that channel for the awesome video and insightful discussions. At first, I was skeptical about whether SpaceX would carry out such an operation so close to the coast, but it seems that the plan went ahead, raising the question about the fate of previous boosters as well. Ultimately, SpaceX needs to decide, either recover Booster 13, which is still afloat, or deliberately sink it. This decision likely ties into the U.S. International Traffic and Arms Regulations, ITAR, which classify most missile and space tech as defense-related. Although ITAR might not seem directly related to rockets, it governs nearly all aspects of rocket and spaceflight hardware. Starship's platform, discussed extensively in public forums and media, includes highly advanced rocket engines and technology that fall under ITAR restrictions. Any leftover components of Starship, including boosters, must not fall into unauthorized hands capable of accessing and studying them. This is the reason why SpaceX decided to recover B-11. However, the same cannot be said for B-10. The difference lies in the depth of the locations where B-11 and B-10 fell. B-11 ended up at a depth of about 61 meters underwater in shallow and accessible waters. The debris from B-11 likely spread within a radius of about 200 meters, making the search and recovery relatively straightforward. Once a piece of debris is found, locating the remaining pieces can proceed fairly quickly. In contrast, B-10 fell to a depth of approximately 800 meters underwater in deep waters beyond the reach of most diving equipment. This depth exceeds the typical limit of standard diving tools by over 500 meters. The debris field for B-10s likely spread over a much larger radius compared to B-11. Recovering B-10 is significantly more challenging and requires specialized equipment. 
To locate B10's degree, a thorough seabed scanning and mapping process would be necessary. So, what will the fate be of Booster 13? Let's wait and see what action SpaceX takes in the coming days. Additionally, there seems to be good news for SpaceX's Phase 2 Starship as the company confidently posted a video from a buoy in the Indian Ocean capturing the splashdown of the Starship spacecraft. It was truly a breathtaking sight. The spacecraft successfully re-entered Earth's atmosphere intact, maneuvering its way to a controlled and gentle landing. Although Starship tilted slightly towards Earth before doing the flip, this maneuver was executed flawlessly to ignite the Raptor engines for the landing burn. This was followed by a successful soft splash down in the Indian Ocean, marking the end of Starship's test flight. The accuracy of the re-entry, the belly flop, the flip, and landing burn is fantastic. Unlike previous Starship tests where the vehicle blew up after landing, this time the spacecraft stayed intact, demonstrating SpaceX's recovery plans. This milestone will undoubtedly be crucial for SpaceX's future efforts to catch Starship using the launch tower in upcoming flights. On top of that, Flight 6 showcased an improvement in heat shield performance compared to Flight 5. The company added a secondary insulation layer to Starship's upper stage and deliberately left heat shields in specific areas to evaluate positioning for future recovery hardware. These areas might eventually see SpaceX adding components to enable Starship to get caught by the tower, similar to plants for Super Heavy Booster. Despite using older heat shields and having exposed sections, Starship withstood intense heat of atmospheric reentry. This stage of the journey featured a steeper re-entry angle designed to put max stress on the forward flaps upper section of the spacecraft. These flaps guide Starship from a horizontal position to a vertical one during the flip maneuver for landing. During re-entry, the spacecraft is almost horizontal, allowing its heat shield to bear the brunt of atmospheric friction and temperature. All this progress could pave the way for Flight 7, where SpaceX is expected to attempt another effort to catch Super Heavy Booster using the tower arms before advancing to fully capture both stages. Soon, the launch date for Flight 7 might not be far off, as NASA indirectly hinted at it in its recent report. NASA is preparing for its imaging operations of SpaceX's Starship rocket through an innovative approach that deviates from its typical use of WB-57 aircraft. Given that the upper stage Starship spacecraft is scheduled to splash down in the Indian Ocean, the WB-57's limited flight range or the potential high operational costs from Australia have prompted an alternative strategy. In a letter to the FAA, NASA requested permission to operate a Gulfstream aircraft with all lights extinguished in Texas. The aircraft, designated NASA-5, will be used for critical imaging calibration in preparation for Starship Flight 7. Brett Pugsley, NASA's Chief of Flight Operations for the Air Operations Division, outlined the agency's unique requirements in the request. Pugsley has specifically asked the FAA to authorize lightless operations in U.S. domestic airspace. These calibration flights are planned over the Gulf of Mexico and southwest Texas, potentially starting as early as December 7th. The primary goal is to calibrate onboard instruments that will be used to image the upper stage Starship spacecraft. The mission's focus is to use NASA-5 sensors to study the Starship's second-stage peak re-entry heating. To achieve precise measurements, the agency needs to minimize all exterior and interior lighting during a one-hour calibration period within the United States. Following the calibration, NASA plans to deploy to Australia January 3rd, a week before the tentative Starship Flight 7 launch, scheduled January 11th. During the mission, NASA will capture the imaging of the Starship re-entry and peak heating events approximately an hour before launch, tracking its trajectory as it appears over the horizon and ultimately splashes down in the eastern Indian Ocean. The Starship program is critical to NASA's efforts to establish a sustainable human presence on the moon under the Artemis program. SpaceX is NASA's prime contract for the human landing system HLS lander that aims to land the first humans on the moon since the Apollo days. HLS is a custom variant of the upper stage Starship spacecraft, which does not have a heat shield since the ship isn't designed to be brought back to Earth. SpaceX's upper stage Starship heat shield is one of the largest of its kind ever built, and it's integral to the rocket's rapid reusability. If the firm can successfully splash down the second stage in the Indian Ocean with Flight 7, then, according to Elon, it'll attempt to catch the rocket with a tower on the next flight. Thanks so much for watching, and see you soon.